and uh, it says in Luke chapter 2, which is one of the chapters about Christmas time, it says in verse 16, so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the babe who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. These are familiar portions of scripture in Matthew chapter 1 and 2 and in Luke chapter 1 and 2. And as you ponder and spend time over this Christmas season meditating in these, these portions, you'll find people and probably introduced to people like Zechariah and Elizabeth and Simeon and Anna in the, in the temple and a myriad of angels and the geography of the travelling of Joseph and Mary. And how that all through it all God was in charge of it. And as I pondered these, these scriptures... And, um, and put them together this week. There was one scripture that sort of came out at me, and it was in Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 6, and it was, let's go on. And really that's the theme of all that I'm going to put together this morning. It's let's go on, let's not stay where we are. And so I'm going on by using the iPad for the first time. <laughs> there you are, you see, we must go on. We can't stay just where we were, but we have to move on. And this text of scripture comes, and it's relevant for us as the life church, and also as in our lives individual, individually, we have to learn to move on. Yeah. We can stay with our memories, and I could keep you 70 years of wonderful memories. But our business is not dwelling with the memories, but making new memories, yeah. and involving other people in the making of the, these new memories. So let's go on. Let's not stay where we are. Let's not look behind, forgetting those things which are be behind and reaching forward unto those things which are before. Now this was penned for Jewish believers. Let's go on. I'm not looking at the, the whole outlook. I, 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 I go out of the denominational box sometimes and I went to, a, a, to an evening meeting and a young, a young preacher came along and he said, tonight I want to preach from the whole, the whole of Hebrews. Oh my goodness. I thought, well, take a verse. No, he wanted to go through the whole of Hebrews. So he went chapter after chapter. When he got near the end, he said, well, we'll leave out the next two chapters. I thought, you better add, otherwise we'll be here till midnight. But th this is just, this. One. it was written to Hebrew believers. And then the danger was, the, da the danger was that they were staying with what they already had. Uh, they were clinging into the past. They had... Um, they had Moses and Joshua and Aaron to look to. But the book of Hebrews tells us there's something better. Jesus is better than Moses. He's better than Joshua. And also they had the temple and they had the sacrifices and they, they had the priesthood. And they wanted to stay with that, even though it was to be destroyed in AD 70. But God is saying, leave it all behind because there's something better. Let's go on, he says, to something better. And so we find this theme coming through the Bible, not to dwell too much on them, but in Genesis chapter 10, there's the whole nations which are born out of the, the, the sons of, of, of Noah. And they're to, 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 supposed to go out and populate the world. But it says that they found a plain, the plain of Shinar, and it says, and they settled there. And they built the building, this agarit, up to heaven. And they said, let's make a name for ourselves. How many fellowships have said those very words? They've stayed still and they've made a name for themselves. And the very next chapter of Genesis chapter 12, it says that they left Ur of the Chaldees and then it says, but when they came to Haran, they settled there. The same words. The danger is to move out with God, but come to a place of settledness. And he's saying to the Hebrew believers, but let's go on. Let's not stay. Let's move forward. And so this morning, let's move forward into Christmas. Another Christmas. It's the nicest season of the year. I love Christmas. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's a, a, a time for materialism. And of course, materialism is a mo monstrous thing. It'll get hold of you and it'll make you miserable. But materialism does that. 
In fact, on CNN this week, it said after Thanksgiving, which was last Thursday, there's Black Friday when everyone goes out and spends and spends for Christmas. And CNN said that there was such a crush in one of the stores that a lady shopper was trampled to death. Now, I mustn't smile at that, but I do smile inside because that's what materialism does. She was crushed to death in the crowd. But it's a special season of the year and I've seen lots of Christmases and I have lovely memories of happy Christmases. In fact, we, uh, we would be decorating, <laughs> we, well, we, we milked the month. Uh, we would be putting the decorations up uh, in school, the first, this, in fact, this particular week. Uh, be, in the secondary school, we'd be putting together Christmas concerts, uh, choirs and orchestras and the like. And of course, we would be interested in Santa. And then, of course, you have met Christians like this who say, you know, if you jumble up those letters in the word Santa, you get the word Satan. Satan. Oh, oh, get a life. <laughs> don't, don't rob me of my, my, my pleasure at Christmas time. But Ursula, Ursula was German, and, and this is going back all those years when uh, Lucas was just a, a baby and a boy, and the others were, were growing up. Because she was German... And we didn't have Aldi at that time. German food and cheeses and sausages came from abroad from my mother-in-law, like Red Cross parcels. And also, there was a shop in Knightsbridge, and I'd go there and buy in the appropriate thing. We had advent calendars, advent candles, uh, an advent bowl. We did all these. And of course, on December the 6th, Father Christmas came to our house because it was St. Nicholas. And we had a Father Christmas uniform, and I'd come up and uh, give them toys out, and then I'd, I'd say, all dressed up, it's cr crazy, isn't it? And then one, one year the children said, Dad, it's you. You're dressed up as Father Christmas. So I did the ceremony, and when I got outside the bedroom, Ursula put on the uniform. And they said, it's you, Dad. No, it wasn't me. I said, come to the window. See, there's Father Christmas going down the... And, and so Father Christmas was going... Because she had a limp. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was the end of that charade. But we loved... So we had all these wonderful things. But then there was... Oh, my mother Mary. She used to come down from Morecambe with toys from aunties and uncles and from grandma and granddad. And we would meet her at this, the train station, Euston, or else it would be uh, a coach station, and she'd be coming off, and she'd be full of black plastic bags, full of toys for the children. And every evening that she spent with us, we would open a present every evening, so there were toys underneath the Christmas tree, and she had a great time with us during those Christmas times. But we have to say, Father Christmas is wonderful, but there came, came a time when the... Let's go on. We can't stay with Father Christmas. You have to focus on Christ. Otherwise, you're left with just, just this, this image of a bearded, old, a bearded old man. But we would sing Christmas carols in the open air, just what you're, we're planning to do again, with the accordion and for charities. But it was beginning to be focused upon the Lord Jesus. Carols by candlelight. And Ursula and I would meditate on these very chapters, Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2. And every year we would shake the tree and find there was always fruit to be had by meditating on these familiar portions, like Mary did. It says she pondered all these things in her heart. So don't think you know the story, because God has new things to show us from his word, particularly in those, these portions of scripture. So let's go on, let's move on to this point in time, as I call it. In verse 2 it says, In those days Caesar Augustus, a real man, in a real time, he issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world and everyone went to his own town to be registered. It was a time of great upheaval. Here is this man in Rome, the Caesar. He decides to have a census. And everyone had to move and make their way 
to the place of their origin. So Joseph and Mary would have to leave Nazareth and go to Bethlehem because of the hues of the line and the lineage of David. And at that time, there was this great upheaval. Throughout the Middle East, populations were moving around. Well, what's new? You go to Lebanon. Well, you we start with Syria, with the refugees going into Lebanon and going into Turkey. Millions, a million in Turkey, in tents through this cold winter. And then, of course, into Jordan as well. Not forgetting Egypt and Libya, the whole world in that area. And what of those who were, who were drowned at sea trying to get into Europe? And, of course, when they're in Europe, they're homeless and there are refugees as well. So it's a real mess. But it's during this time of upheaval that it's the right time for Christ to be born. It's an opportunity for the gospel. And in these camps, there are believers. They're not, they're not meeting in churches, buildings like we might expect a church to be. They're meeting in a tent, as Israel did in the wilderness. And they're meeting just in a simple way like ourselves are this morning. Because the church is the people. And there are pastors out there who are gathering together, his flock together. And they're worshipping the Lord Jesus. Amongst the Islamic population, they love the Lord Jesus and they found him as their saviour. So Christmas is a very special time for them. Though they seem to have so little, as they seem to have so little being moved around, having to leave with so little, if, if anything at all. They've lost everything. The money's gone. Their home has gone. There's nothing to go back to. But they say, but let's go on. There's something of a future, even for us, in these desperate situations. I know why he did it, this Caesar, because he was a political scientist, this Caesar. <clears throat> he had to have a census. He had to know how many people there are there, what ages they, they were. He wanted to know what property they owned. And it's just the same today. Politicians play with figures and statistics because they know that they can put taxes on people and then they have money to spend on what they want to spend it on. So we'll put the puppets on one side because the, the, the politicians on one side because they're just puppets in the hand of God. Caesar Augustus thought he, he was calling the shots, that he was in charge of the situation. The whole Roman Empire was his to do as he wanted. But God was in charge. The government is on his shoulders this morning. He's in charge. Whoever's in Parliament, who's ever, who's ever doing what they want to do, even though in a democracy we can't do anything until next time we have an election. And then they'll still do what they want to do. They'll still tax us. But at the same time we have to say that God is still on the throne and he will remember his own. We have to go on. And so Joseph also, verse 4, went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea in, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And whilst they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, because everyone was of the same tribe of Judah, they just found a warm welcome. Well, no, they didn't get a warm welcome. They went from place to place. There was no room for them, even in the inn. But she was pregnant. She was expecting a baby on Friday. But no, there was no, there was the, <laughs> there was no room for them. Why? Because they were identified with Jesus. And there's no place for Jesus. There's no place for anyone who's identified with Jesus. And so they're put into a, a place round the back, put into a cave, into a place where the animals were. But even in that rebuff, even in that rejection, we see how kind God was. Who wants to have a baby in the, the gaze of an inn full of people in those days? But God is able to do something privately for Mary, who's having her baby for the first time. She was going to be witnessed by the animals and not by the animals that would have been in the inn at that particular time. 
So God is in charge. God is sovereign. It was a point in time. This is not a Father Christmas story. This is not made up. This is not one of those fables that we read of in Peter's. Peter's. It's not a fable. This is a fact. Jesus was born in the time of Caesar Augustus. It was an appointed time. And it was an appointed town. They had to be, he had to be born in Bethlehem. But she's expecting the baby. And not far. She's going to give birth to the baby. But they're in Nazareth. And yet this decree is brought about so that he can bring two people. Two people. That's the whole point of the census. That's the whole point of this upheaval. So that his plan and purpose might be fulfilled. To bring two people all the way down. No miscarriage on the way. Until they came to Bethlehem where she gave birth to Jesus. You see how sovereign God is. He's not only interested in the governments of the world. He's interested in you as a couple. You as individuals. His plans and his purpose can never be thwarted. They can never be put off. If 500 years earlier God had spoken through Micah the prophet saying, in Bethlehem of Judea the Messiah is going to be born, then in the due time he's going to be born, and he's going to be born not in us. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. God always has his way. Oh, men can put their fists up. They can do this. They can do that to the Jews. But the Jews end up in Israel as a result even of the Holocaust, a very strange quirk of history. But God will always have his way. If Israel is to be in the land, if Israel is to be, is to be a nation, after 2,000 years, he will bring it to pass. And in 1948, we live to see the fulfillment of God's ancient promises to his people, the Jewish nation. So let's go on. Let's go on. Jesus Christ came into the world, and we, we have just been, but we can't stay there. You say, well, it's nice to stay there at Christmas. But he came into the world for a purpose. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The just, for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. We have been remembering in these emblems his broken body on the cross. His poured out blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes us. If we have sin, uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So it's not sufficient to stay at the cradle. We have to go on to the, to the Calvary and onto the cross and the crucifixion. It's part of this wonderful good news. Christ Jesus was born that first time. But he came to do something. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And to give his life a ransom for many. But I say, but let's go on. There's something more beyond all that. Because that Christmas time teaches us that not only did he come to die for our sins, he died so that we might come to him. You might know all these facts. You might have been so well Christianized that you know this objective truth. What Jesus did, where he was born, and you could pass your GCSE by re rehearsing these statistics, these, these facts. But that's not Christianity. Christianity is this. Going on from there and coming to Christ. Now there are theologians that I know of. They know all the facts. And they've got their doctorate in all these facts. But you know what? They have never come to Christ. I've met bishops who know the facts, who know their church doctrine, and, but they have never come to Christ. They'll, they'll, they'll say that. They don't know this experience. I was in a college, a Catholic college, and um, I was talking to this man, Dennis Devine, who was in charge of the history, and we were discussing one-to-one -one in his study, as you do. And then I talked to him about the Bible and how important it was to come to Christ. With all your Catholicism, there's a personal encounter with Christ. And it's not through the Mass, it's through a personal faith in Jesus. And you can know him even without the church. It was all Lutheran stuff that was pointing to him, if you like. And he said, he said to me, stay there. Stay, don't move, don't go away, stay there. Oh, 
and he ran. Dennis Devine ran down the corridor. He went to his pro the professor of philosophy, philosophy of education, the, and he he ran with Dennis Devine back. He says, he says, tell him, tell him, tell him just what you've said, just what you've said. And here is a, a doctorate in philosophy and a doctorate in theology and history, and here these looking to me to tell them that there's something more. You've got to go beyond the statistics. You've got to come to Christ. You've got to come to Christ. I found it in the hospital. In the hospital there were doctors way up here. And I was down here as an auxiliary nurse in the London hospital at that time. And outside he was up there and I was down here. But when we came to the Nurses Christian Fellowship, these people said to me, tell us, tell us about this. Why? Because in the Nurses Christian Fellowship, they were down there in their knowledge of Jesus and coming to him. And, these, and I was up here because of what I could share. Because I was saying to them, you know it all, but you need to know this. You have to go on to come to Christ. And that's what they did. And this Christmas time, to, to round it all up, there were two groups of people who did come to Christ. The shepherds, of course, are the ones that we think of in Luke chapter 2. These shepherds were a, a people in their own right. They were known to be ostracized. They were outsiders. They were smelly. They were stinky. Uh, there was no place for them in the synagogue. It was a job that, for the unemployable, the people who were not academic, they weren't clever, but they could look after sheep. And these men were out on the hillside of Bethlehem looking after sheep. They were just nobodies. It's what they said to, it's what they said to the disciples. These men are poor and ignorant fishermen. I tell you, though they were poor and ignorant, I don't think that you could be ignorant to be a fisherman in those days. Poor and ignorant, they knew Christ. They had come to Christ. They fellowshiped with him. They spent time with him. They had more in their little finger than they, did, they had in the collection of all the priests in the temple. That's how different it was. And these were just outsiders altogether. But it was to them, it was to the outsiders that Christ came. It was to the outsiders that they, after 400 years of prophetic silence from Malachi, after 400 years of silence, the heavens started this great song of redemption. Um, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Goodwill towards men. And they were afraid. And I say this this morning, that coming to Christ is, is, is prefixed by a revelation from heaven. Only heaven is going... The books won't help you here. It's heaven will open up. It has to speak to you from heaven. And you have to be converted. You have to be born again. How... What, can, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born to get... No, he's, Jesus says, that which is of the earth is earthy. But that which is of heaven, you have to be born again from above by the Holy Spirit. And as you call upon the name of the Lord and you close in, as the old brethren used to say, as you close in with Christ, you will find there's a witness in your spirit that I am a child of God. I've been born again. I'm different. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. But it is only as you repent and turn to Jesus by faith and as you come to him, as those shepherds did. The Apostle Paul had the same experience. He said, I didn't learn this gospel in Galatians. I didn't learn this gospel from going to Jerusalem and hearing Peter and James and John. I didn't learn it from them. I received it by revelation of Jesus Christ. And the gospel that we have this morning, it's still by revelation. The Bible is a book of revelation. You'd say, are there miracles today? It's revealed there are. Did Christ die for your sins? It's revealed that he did. And if I come to Christ, are my sins forgiven? It's revealed that he can and he will and he'll do it. But it's a revelation that comes from heaven. And we'll never find it out by worldly wisdom. Because by worldly wisdom, even the wisdom of this world, no man can know God. Someone says they know God and they don't know Jesus well, you want us to say it's a false idea that you've got. Because though there are many ways to Jesus, there's only one way to God. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you've seen me, 
You have seen the Father. We have to come to Jesus. And people who don't know Jesus and are just religious, they talk about God. They even say that God is Allah. Well, that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. It's revealed. And that this God had a son, and his name is Jesus. And God became flesh in him, and he dwelt among us. These are the truths, but they have to be revealed to us. And they are revealed to us in the scriptures. And so the shepherds did come. Having heard, they said, let's go with haste. And if you're like one of these shepherds, feeling outcast, feeling down and out, nobody wants you, rejected and put on one side, and the psychologists will have a field day with you. They'll love to get you on their couch. They'll love to charge you money for their, for their hourly surgery. I say baloney to that. That's a, that's a Greek word, I think, baloney. Baloney to that. I say you have access through the Lord Jesus with God himself. And this morning you can say, Lord Jesus, I'm casting all my care upon you because you care for me. And God so cared for those shepherds that they were the first to hear that a saviour had been born for them. They came, they knew where to go, it was going to be in a manger, they were familiar with stables. The temple, well, that was not their, their place, nor was the synagogue. But they knew about stables, and Jesus was in the stable. He had stooped so low to being in a stable, so that he was available for anybody, stinky and smelly as they might be, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and just as I am, I come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. And you can come just as you are. But I say before we leave this text, and before I finish, I say we've got to let us go on. The, the shepherds did. They said we can't stay with the committee. We're not going to discuss this. Let's go with haste. And they moved on and found Christ and shared the truth of it. But I'm saying let's linger a little longer with the wise men. Now these were not down and out. And the evangelical church today, and we can sometimes include ourselves in this, is we're so taken up with the down and outs and the soup kitchens and giving them food and clothes, and rightly so. But you know what? There are millionaires. There are multi-millionaires. And you know what? They're as lost as the down and outs are today. We have to sort of put on God's spectacles. Every time I, I sing, God save our gracious queen, I really mean it. I want her to be saved. I want her to come to Christ. And I want her to confess Christ. And she's very slow at it. So are her, so are her, her children. And so are the politicians. There's a, there's a political correctness that they hide behind. And I'm not interested whether they've been to Eton or, Colli uh, or Cambridge or Oxford. It matters not. Our Chancellor of the Exchequer, has he got a degree in economics? No, he hasn't. He's got a BA in history. Read it up on on the web. That's all he's got. And we put all this responsibility into his hands. I'm becoming a politician all of a sudden. I'm just saying that the, there are people out there, but God is able to introduce us to these people. And as I say kindly this morning, this is not everybody's kind of music. When I was at the college and the academy, there are young people there who wouldn't even come and listen to this kind of music. They wanted an orchestra. He wanted horns and trumpets and violins. They would go to All Souls Langham Place, where John, the late John Stott was. Why? Because they had an orchestra. We get, and there, there are some people, perhaps your boss at work would think gladly of you if you were able to find two tickets for him and his wife, and you and your wife, make it available and say, we're going to Handel's Messiah in Manchester this Christmas. Would you and your wife like to come and we can have a meal out and, and go to some really nice posh hotel for a meal? Why? Because it's their language. It's their way of doing it. And I knew David, David, uh, I've forgotten his name, a missionary uh, uh, in Africa. And he, he said to us as young people, he said, don't go to Africa and be a missionary. Don't go to Africa and give out tracts. He says, come to me after the meeting. Tell me what your qualification is. 
Is it in education? Is it in politics? Is it in oil? Is it in sciences? Come and tell me. He says, you come back to Africa with me and I'll put you in a job that makes lots and lots of money. And through that, you'll be able to finance the spread of the gospel in Africa. And it was new to people. And when he travelled, he always got a first-class ticket on the aeroplane. Why? Because on his way to Africa, he would be sitting in the first-class compartment. He would meet people. He met an ambassador. And he befriended him on the plane. And on the plane, the ambassador said, well, if you're coming to, to this place, well, come and visit me. And here is this man, David Newington. He comes, lands the plane, and he goes to the ambassador's residence, and he talks to him about Jesus. You see, we're so taken up with the shepherds and the stinky area, we're forgetting that there are wise men, and listen to this for a racist statement, they're coming from the east. We can get so sucked into racialism that we don't want to like anybody coming who's from the east. But there are people from the far east, from the Middle East, or even from France, or even from Bulgaria. We don't want that. But don't be sucked into it. Because we can't go to them and bring the, take the gospel, but they can come to us. Don't you feel that God is bringing these people in? I believe so. Uh, so, and I always wanted to be missionaries. Either China, I don't know, we don't need to go to China. Uh, all, I need to, all I need to do now is to go to the Lake District. There are more Chinese in the Lake District than there are in Beijing. <laughs> Everybody's coming. And in Liverpool the other day, shopping at the Christmas market, they were all Chinese. I thought, my, beam me up back to Manchester, Scotty, because they're coming over here. And whereas we wanted to go as missionaries, we were unable to through physical uh, problems, uh, but we, we have ended up in East Ham, and we ended up in Barking, and in Stratford, and there were 15 nationalities, weren't there, in that church we left uh, 10 years ago. They, they came to us. They were, Afro-Caribbeans came to us, and then the Indians came to us, and of course the Philippines, they came to us, and when the wall fell in 1990, the Poles came to us, the Czechoslovakians came to us, and they heard us because we were singing choruses in the open air. We couldn't go to them, but God sent them to us. And these wise men from the east, they had come seeking after him. Now, they were clever men. They were the sat nabs of the time, because they studied the stars. How did you cross a desert without getting lost? You had the stars to plot. How did they cross the oceans and land at the very port they were aiming for? Across the Mediterranean Sea, to Alexandria, or to Rome, or to send... How did they get there? They plotted the stars. That's why there was a shipwreck in Paul's time, because the clouds were blotting the skies and they couldn't chart the stars.